Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Neutral Ground Podcast. Today, I'm going to build off of the previous podcast episode where we started talking about neo-modernism. In that episode, we discussed kind of what neo-modernism is, where it came from, and some of the ways in which it impacts our culture today. Now, before we we dive into this episode proper, I want to say that I've received some wonderful feedback from people via email about the first five-part historical movements series that I did. And I want to say, please don't be shy about sending in your thoughts. You can do so through email at theneutralgroundpodcast at gmail.com, or, and I really encourage you to do this, you can go to my website at theneutralgroundpodcast.com, and you can click on the contact link at the top of the website, and you can actually leave an audio comment, which, if it's good, if it has some really nice thoughts in it that we can grapple with, I will use it in the podcast. What I want to say is thank you because I do feel like we're starting to build really a wonderful community of listeners and thinkers here, and I really couldn't be more thrilled at this this prospect here of of what we're building together. So thank you for that. Now today I want to start a three part series on the three main aspects of neo-modernism that I believe are the core principles that are driving this current historical movement and, I think, much of our very culture today. The reason why I want to kind of slow play this a little bit and, and dive into these in their own episodes is because I want to lay out with more detail why I think these are important traits for us to deal with in neo-modernism and how... I think confronting these traits might make us feel more connected with the culture, with our own place in the historical movement, and really just kind of more connected with each other in general. So, just for a reminder, the three traits that I see currently in neo-modernism are narrative reassurance, transcendence of the corporeal, meaning the body, and the need to create sacred space. Today I'll be talking about the first trait, narrative reassurance. And I want to be clear about something. These these traits that we're going to discuss, they didn't just come out of nowhere. I've been defining, challenging, rethinking, and kind of reforging these over the better part of the last few years. I've tested them in the classroom with students, and let me tell you something about testing theories in the classroom. If there isn't at least a vein of truth in what you bring to the classroom— Students will let you know, and I love them for it. They'll tell you whether or not there's anything there. And uh, I have absolutely brought theories to the classroom only to get kind of looks like, what are you talking about? So even though I'm the one in the room with the PhD in the classroom, I always feel like it's important to be open to listening to what the students have to say. If you can't say what you need to say in a way that makes sense to them, then it's probably not worth saying at all. Or at the very least, it might not be ready to kind of birth out into the world, you know, to release the ill-formed offspring of my feeble mind, as the great American poet Anne Bradstreet said. Finally, this is still going to be an organic thinking kind of episode, meaning although I've got the ideas pretty well in hand, you're likely going to hear me kind of work with and struggle with the ideas at times. And if this podcast is going the way that I hope it is, you should be grappling with them as well. Don't be afraid to kind of pause and challenge and think about what I'm saying here. Now, some of the questions that I want to explore in this episode are, how did we lose narrative assurance? What is narrative reassurance? Why do we need it? And where do we see it manifesting itself in our current culture? Now, you might recall from our kind of two-part mini-series that was within the series. Hmm, a series within a series. How very meta. I'm getting off track already. You might recall that postmodernism introduced narrative skepticism. At first, it mostly confined itself to skepticism of what we would call grand narratives. These are kind of all-encompassing stories that attempt to define major human concepts and or maybe some aspect of the human experience. Sometimes they're called meta-narratives as well. However, although it started off as skepticism of just those grand or meta-narratives, 
I think it slowly spread to language itself and then even personal narratives so that people no longer felt as though their stories carried any sense of value or meaning by the time we get to, uh, I would say, roughly the early to mid-2000s. Now, do we at times need to glance upon a narrative with a skeptical eye? Yeah, I think so. Again, don't buy into the hype that postmodernism is all bad. It's not. There are times when reading something from a skeptical perspective can actually help us balance out our own biases. When I read something that I completely agree with, at first, you know, like most people, it makes me feel good, vindicated, even, dare I say, a bit self-righteous, which is always pretty much when I know that something's gone wrong. But then I'll, I'll start to actually use some of that postmodern skepticism, and I'll think about how that narrative got me to be so much on its side. And I'll start to grapple with the major points and try to contextualize them against myself, against the person that I ultimately want to be in life. And oftentimes when I do that, I'll find at least a few parts where I'll go, wait a minute, I'm not so sure that I actually do agree with all of this, this stuff, these ideas. And that's why thinking as a process needs to be time-consuming and muddy. Right, You need to think, rethink, live with something for a little bit. So there are times when a postmodern skepticism can be useful. The problem is when you apply this skepticism to all things, at all times, and it becomes your very own ethos, right? Your, your, Your sense of self is built around a kind of cynical reading of all human narratives. I would argue that if that's you you're in a pretty bad place in life. If we can't agree on certain basic fundamental aspects of humanity, that we need to be kind, offer mercy as much as we can, show respect, and value individual integrity, if we can't maintain those bonds of humanity, then we're in trouble. So how do we help build and maintain those bonds of humanity, especially today, when things seem to be so contentious and argumentative? Through narrative reassurance. And what I mean by that is, by reading, ingesting, telling stories that reassure us that there are certain universal values that we can agree upon and even build relationships with, or build relationships upon, I should say. We get those connective bonds from narratives that have stood the test of time and by listening to great stories that speak to the core of humanity and reinforce them. Now, I'm going to regale you with a story from my past, from a time when I was actually training to become a secondary school English teacher. Although I teach college now, at one point in my life, I did teach junior high and high school for a very little bit. This was, I guess, quite some time ago now, but I still very much value the experience of it because I met a lot of wonderful kids who were really fun to be around. But there's one story that I'll always remember. I was a student teacher at the time, and it was a seventh grade English class, so I guess roughly like 13-year-olds. One of the lessons that my cooperating teacher was using, and it was a good lesson, actually, was this concept of having the students build their own towns. Now, I don't remember what book it was connected to, but I do remember it was a good lesson. They had to quite literally draw a town on paper, you know, put in these squares and identify the core buildings and utilities that their town needed to have. When it came time to share these towns with each other, one of the students was kind of rattling off these buildings in his town, He had schools, video game stores, grocery stores, and then he said, porn shop. And everyone in the room just went silent. It was one of those moments that you could feel the thickness of tension in the room. And the student felt it immediately and was like, what? What's the big deal? My cooperating teacher pushed for some clarity 
Like, what do you mean? What are you saying? And the student said, yeah, a, a porn shop. You know, where you can bring things in and get money for them. And we all gave a collective exhale and said, oh, a pawn shop, P-A-W-N. We all had a good laugh, even the student, because he knew what he meant. He just didn't kind of have the right word there. You get those funny moments, actually, teaching in junior high, where the students still kind of occupy that, that liminal space between child and teenager. In that moment, however... We all experienced what narratologist Jerome Bruner calls a narrative breach. This is a moment in a story that creates a genuinely jarring effect that almost completely takes the reader out of the spell of listening to a story. Sometimes these breaches can actually be used really effectively as a form of narrative construction. If you're a Final Fantasy video game fan, I'm sure you remember the first time that you experienced the seen with the death of Eris, which is an amazingly disturbing moment. But it makes you want to continue to play the game and actually win. On the other hand, sometimes narrative breaches can really ruin a story for some people. One example of a narrative breach that I would argue didn't quite work so well is the death of Glenn in The Walking Dead. People were genuinely disturbed by the way in which he was killed in the series. And there were articles written on the the problematic scene. And people even claimed a kind of viewer trauma over it. Now, just prior to my junior high student clarifying that he meant a pawn shop, that student created a narrative breach in the room for those of us who know what the other word means. I bring up this concept of a narrative breach because in postmodernism we experienced large amounts of narrative breaches in various forms, and it destabilized our trust in narratives. I love going to the movies, and, and you tell me if you've experienced this. I love going to the movies with someone, and about halfway through the film they kind of lean over and whisper to me, I think I know who did it. I think I know the twist. But you know what? You want to know what the twist really is? There is no twist. It's just a straightforward narrative. People always seem to kind of yearn for the twist. Yearn for that destabilized narrative. And it's almost like when we don't get the twist in the movie now, we're kind of like, Hmm, you mean this is just a story? It's like, yeah, it's just a story. And because you were kind of looking so hard for that destabilizing twist moment, you've actually missed a good story that we could have shared a kind of common bond around. Okay, let me fast forward a little bit here. So about a year later after that, after teaching junior high, I'm teaching in high school. And I was very fortunate enough I got to teach 9, 10, and grade 12. So everything except 11th grade, which, I mean, I guess is a, a bit ironic considering my field of specialty is, is American Lit, and that I didn't even get to teach American Lit. But one of the interesting aspects of the school curriculum in New York State, and I don't know if this is still the case actually, But in each year of high school, the students had to read at least one Shakespearean play. And I think they might not have had to read it in 11th grade because of the American Lit thing, but they they might have. Either way, in 9th grade, high school students traditionally read like Romeo and Juliet, probably because they, you know, have access to that story in so many different forms and adaptations. And it's, it's pretty accessible in terms of its plot, right? In 10th grade, you read either Othello or Julius Caesar. And then in 12th grade, students traditionally read either Hamlet or A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now, from my own personal experience teaching it, I think students actually reacted pretty positively to having to read those plays. When I say positively, I just mean that they've heard of the great William Shakespeare so much 
that I think they they were open to kind of seeing what's so great about it, right? Like they would go into it going, all right, Bill Shakespeare, you got me for at least a couple of pages. Let's see what's so great about you. And let me tell you, sometimes that's the best place that you can have students, even at the college level, is when they're like, I've heard of this. I'm open to seeing what's so great about it. Now, the beauty of this high school curriculum was that it gave students from all different backgrounds things that they could discuss with each other. I'm not saying that students went around saying, Canst thou believe what atrocities befell fair Desdemona and the most worthy Othello? No, they most definitely didn't do that. At least, I never heard them do that. But there was a connection there. And when they came upon themes and characters from those stories, for example, a character like Iago from Othello, the type of person who is so good at manipulation that he can lead you toward your own very destruction and make you believe that you were in control of it the entire time. Exposure to that kind of character gives not just young people, but all of us, a frame of reference to be able to spot potential Iagos in our own lives. It gives us a template for one aspect of evil, the destructive force of manipulation. Now, for hundreds of years, people read Shakespeare's Othello and could use that reference of Iago as a kind of stable narrative. They could reference that someone was like an Iago figure in real life, And you knew to be wary of that person because we had narrative assurance in our understanding that Iago was evil. So anyone who's like Iago, we should kind of keep away from. All of that was the case until you get to the skepticism of postmodernism. Now, if you do a quick search on Google with the question, is Iago evil? you will find a bevy of answers, many of which are very postmodern in their approach, where people try to push back on the concept that he is, in fact, evil. I'm not saying that all of the people who question this are trying to do anything malicious in any way. In fact, I'll talk probably a little bit later on about why this can be quite a useful personal exercise for us. They're most likely just utilizing that postmodern skeptical eye to test what is often considered a pretty straightforward reading. Iago is a horrific human being. They might also be trying to distinguish between human evil and cosmological evil. Does Iago portray evil in a cosmological way? Now that's a good question. I think you can make a a pretty decent argument that he does represent a kind of cosmological evil but that might be for another time. Nonetheless, Iago's actions in the play and his choices, and I mean his direct choices, what he does, lead to the deaths of multiple people, some of whom are at least portrayed as fairly innocent or pretty innocuous. So how do we deal with a character like Iago today in neo-modernism? And what do we do with the story? Well, Let's bring this question onto the neutral ground for a moment and really grapple with it. Is it wrong to test whether or not Iago can be labeled as evil? No. In fact, this is the first step to developing a kind of narrative reassurance again. In order to make the question of Iago's evil a meaningful exercise in a neo-modern context, you need to break with the postmodern protocol and define evil for yourself. You need to take a personal stance on what evil actually looks like, what it is. In doing so, you are attempting to create narrative reassurance. You're saying, this is what evil looks like to me. And the beauty of that concept is that once you do that, you can create a kind of template from which you can then go out in the world, put that template up against other ideas and stories, and either build up the person that you want to be, or protect the parts of yourself that you are happy with. 
You build up your narrative reassurance, and the more you do this, the more you begin to build up your templates for the world, the more the world can start to make sense, and I think the less anxious we become in situations where our definitions and templates are being tested. Now, these templates, however, need to be like spider webs. Well, hear me out. Think about this. They're strong enough to carry our own weight and the weight of others, right? Think about what a spider web can actually carry. Not just the spider, but like multiple insects and things like that. So they're actually super strong. But they also need to be light enough that if need be, a strong wind can kind of just wisp them away so that they can be rebuilt, restructured, reconfigured, on our continuing engagement with the template and with society. I think that metaphor of the spider web actually comes from Nietzsche on truth and lies in a non-moral sense. It's a fantastic metaphor. You need to be open to, to tweaking your templates, to refining them. Now, I'm not saying that you always need to destroy them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying... We often need to make minor adjustments now and then. Why? Because you're constantly evolving as a thinking and socializing human being. Tell me, when did Socrates stop his process of growth and thinking? When he died. You can and should build a solid core of templates that you believe will lead you to be the best version of who you want to be as a human being. But you must be open to tweaks. However, if you're constantly destroying your templates and rebuilding them from the ground up, that's not good. It means you're not actually defining any core principles for yourself, and you're probably not spending enough time reflecting on who you actually want to be. If you can't even define what a good person is, How the heck are you supposed to judge your own actions and the way that you interact with others? You can't. And if you have no clear criteria for judging what is good in you, how can you ever reassure within yourself that which is best in you? You can't. And that is one of the reasons why I think so many people today feel so terrible about themselves, like everything they do is wrong, and that they, they, they simply have no good inside them. The first thing that I would ask those people is, what is good to you? Write it down. Construct what a good person is, does, says. And then go out into the world with that template and see the world through the template. Don't try to be it at the very beginning. See it in the world. Identify it. Then, start to slowly move yourself toward being that good person. And a good person is not a perfect person. Don't create a perfect individual from which you assure your own failure, and then you can feel justified when you just give up. I'll tell you one of my traits of being a good person. A good person tries to maximize positive emotional engagement with others. Now, do I always do this? Nope. I screw up like everybody else. But the key word in that statement is tries. I know when I actually try to do this and when I don't. And I can judge myself fairly based on that. Now, you do need to make the foundation of your templates sturdy, right? So that you can build upon them and then make your your tweaks here and there, right? But they also must be malleable in case your templates start to degrade into a kind of irascible tyranny. You can trap yourself within your own templates so that you no longer experience what it means to be human. That's an incredibly dangerous place to be in because you will slowly decay inside and start to remove yourself from humanity. You will find yourself only comfortable with yourself because that's the only connection that you feel you can control. And even that's a lie. Your templates become walls. At first, they are walls to keep others out. But then they quickly become walls to keep you in. 
This is why it's important that you test your templates constantly. And if you do find that you need to make certain adjustments there, you need to do so. Now, as always, I try to bring in some literature or philosophy for us to really grapple with that connects with our theme for the podcast. For this episode, I'm actually going to quote from a movie. And as much as I love the Lord of the Rings books, and trust me, I'll be quoting from the books plenty of times in the course of this podcast, as good as the speech by Sam is in The Two Towers, in the books, I mean, look, the movie version nails it. Those movies weren't just well done. We loved them because they spoke to our yearning for neo-modern seriousness, for narrative reassurance. Just listen to this, and I think you'll hear what I mean. This is a speech from Sam toward the end of The Two Towers, and it really comes at kind of their worst, lowest point, right? When they're about to just kind of give up. And Sam says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. But we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered. Full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going, because they were holding on to something. What are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo. And it's worth fighting for. Now, I challenge you to listen to that speech and not go out into the world and build up your templates of good, to leave the world of cynicism behind and find good. Quest for it. Look for it in those you love, and more importantly, look for it in those you despise. Because no matter how dark the world becomes, no matter how many people cast dirty looks at you, no matter how many times you fall down and the people around you simply laugh, Never forget, there is good in the world. And good is a real force. And it is magnified with every smile, every time you extend humanity to another. You don't simply build a narrative of reassurance for yourself. You live it. You bring it out to others. And in doing so, you show others that there is good in the world. And I promise you, if you bring that goodness out and embody it, it will catch on with the people in your house, in your work, in your community, in the country, and in the world. All great pieces of literature and media have known this fact forever. Goodness can triumph over hate. But it must be believed and practiced. And you will fail at times. You will hate. You will be frustrated. But that is not the source of your failure. You fail only if you do not try the next time. I hope you took something positive away from this episode. In the next episode, we're going to take a look at the second part of this series, the importance of transcending the corporeal or the body. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on the neutral ground and have a great day.
I thank you for taking the time to listen, and I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If you did enjoy the episode, please do me a favor. Consider supporting my endeavor to create this kind of new community of people by doing one of the following. Leave a positive rating, a kind comment, and or subscribing to the podcast on whichever platform you're currently using to listen to me now. Additionally, you can find me on joemeyer.substack.com and on my main website, theneutralgroundpodcast.com, where you can listen to episodes and contact me with a question or comment via email, or even you can leave an audio comment with some thoughts of your own. If your comment is particularly thoughtful and can spark some good kind of thought within us, I'll use it on the show and we'll grapple with it together. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you for your time. It is truly appreciated.